This is Leah Rajewski. I'm the General Counsel of CFP Board. And on behalf of CFP Board, uh, welcome to our webinar today concerning CFP Board's proposed Code of Ethics and Standards of Conduct. I apologize for some of the difficulties we've been experiencing this morning by audio. Uh, we had been um, moving forward with the program, and we had learned that you were not able to hear what we were saying during this process. So uh, we're going to start again and begin the webinar now. And again, I apologize for any inconvenience to you. So by way of background, CFP Board's mission is to benefit the public by granting the CFP certification and upholding it as the recognized standard of excellence for competent and ethical personal financial planning. CFP Board began this process of reviewing and revising its standards in late 2015. At CFP Board, which is a standard setting organization, reviewing standards is a core business function that the organization undertakes periodically to maintain the value, integrity, and relevance of the certification. It was in December of 2015 that CFP Board launched the Commission on Standards and charged it with reviewing and recommending to the Board of Directors changes to four of the sections of the standards of professional conduct, including the terminology, code of ethics and professional responsibility, rules of conduct, and financial planning practice standards. The Commission on Standards was very intentionally comprised of CFE professionals representing various business and compensation models. The Commission also includes individuals with regulatory experience, a consumer advocate, and a member of the public. Um, the names of the members who serve on the Commission are provided here. It's led by Ray Ferrara, the Chair, and includes Chris Beard, Allison Bishop, Dave Fogel, Diane LaSeuse, Linda Lights, Terry Lister, Sue Messenger, Matt Murphy, Bob Plays, Christopher Rand, Peter Richardson, Barb Roper, and Jeffrey Sills. After the commission was launched, CFP Board scheduled and held public forums in cities around the country, nine cities in total, and also met with various stakeholder groups, including the Financial Planning Association, the National Association of Personal Financial Advisors, and some of CFP Board's own councils and commissions, such as the Business Model Council and the Disciplinary and Ethics Commission. One commissioner and one board member attended each of these forums. The Commission then held six in-person meetings where they met for several days to review and revise the standards, as well as approximately 100 subcommittee meetings where members of the Commission reviewed and discussed the existing language and proposed changes to it. Ultimately, the Commission made its recommendations to the Board of Directors, and the Board then issued for public comment the final proposed changes that are now out for public comment. Since CFP Board published the proposed changes on June 20th, CFP Board is engaged with stakeholders. Again, CFP Board scheduled and held public forums in eight cities around the country, and the public comment period expires on August 21st. We encourage everybody who's listening to this webinar and otherwise to submit your comments to CFP Board so that they may be considered as part of this process as CFP Board moves forward with finalizing the revised standards. Once CFP Board has reviewed and considered the public comments, the Commission on Standards will review them and then make its recommendation to the Board of Directors. The Board of Directors will either uh, issue a final action, issue its final uh, standards that will go into effect at a later date, or issue the proposed changes for another round of comment. Ultimately, CFP Board will provide the effective date of the revised standards. Before we begin to talk about some of the substantive provisions, I'd like to discuss with you uh, the issue concerning oversight of CFP professionals that currently exist. So, uh, we're all aware that CFP professionals are regulated at many different levels. The first level are the regulations that exist on the federal level through the SEC or the Department of Labor, as well as through self-regulatory organizations such as FINRA. 
on top of that existing federal regulation, there is also state regulation that applies in various circumstances, including, for example, with respect to the regulation of insurance. On top of the federal and state regulations, there's oversight provided by firms at which CFP professionals work, and firms may provide additional standards that apply to CFP professionals. On top of that uh, pyramid is professional organizations such as CFP Board, which have their own standards of conduct uh, that, uh, that govern. And then finally, at the top of the py pyramid um, is the individual's own compass uh, for their own ethical uh, considerations in determining how to provide advice to clients. So as we consider uh, that pyramid of advisor oversight, uh, let's talk briefly about the key changes that are set forth in the proposed revised standards. So focusing on the mission of CFP Board, there are several important changes. First of all, we received feedback in February of 2016 from CFP professionals around the country that they would prefer that we combine these standards into one document. In other words, under the current standards, there are four separate documents that govern the terminology, code of ethics, practice standards, and rules of conduct. And the perspective we heard is that it would be helpful for CFP Board to consolidate those documents into one uh, for greater ease and use by CFP professionals and members of the public. Another key change is that the application of CFP Board's fiduciary duty has been extended from all financial planning to all financial advice. We'll talk about uh, that again a little bit later. There is also, uh, as part of the proposal, a rebuttable presumption that financial planning is required, in other words, that the practice standards apply to the engagement. The proposed revised standards also update the factors that CFP Board will weigh in determining whether financial planning um, ha is required. And finally, the practice standards themselves uh, which have not been uh, modified in some time, have been updated to reflect the modern practice of financial planning. So let's move forward to the Code of Ethics, which is on page one of the proposed revised standards. The Code of Ethics sets forth uh, the ethical principles that govern CFP professionals. The proposal shortens the Code of Ethics so that it contains the principles but not the operative language that gives life to the principles. In other words, under the existing standards, there's a standard that requires CAP professionals to act with diligence, and the current standards then describe what it means to act diligently. The proposed revised standards set forth, sets forth the ethical principles and leaves the operative language for the standards of conduct themselves. What this allows is for the Code of Ethics to be shorter, more crisp, and allows CFP Board to combine various principles that at one point had been set forth as separate ethical principles. So, for example, the first item in the Code of Ethics refers to acting with honesty, integrity, confidence, and diligence. These ethical principles previously had been set forth separately, but by removing the operative language they can now be combined into one. Altogether, there are six uh, lines in the Code of Ethics that talk about acting in the client's best interests, exercising due care, avoid or disclose and manage conflicts of interest, maintain the confidentiality and protect the privacy of client information, and act in a manner that reflects positively on the financial planning profession and CFP certification. CFP Board heard during the public forums in February of 2016 that many CFP professionals take the Code of Ethics and print them out and provide them to their clients. This was another reason that the Code of Ethics was shortened, because CFP Board envisioned that this Code of Ethics uh, might be presented as a standalone version that CFP professionals might share, and share with and provide to clients to explain exactly what it means uh, to be a CFP professional. The first section in the standards of conduct is the duties owed to clients. Altogether, there are 17 duties, many of which we'll discuss today. Some of these 
we mentioned already in connection with the Code of Ethics. So, for example, the duty of competence, diligence, integrity, professionalism, these are concepts that have been set forth in the existing Code of Ethics, and that operative language was moved to the standards of conduct and is presented in an updated format in the proposed revised standards. We will go through several of these provisions, including the fiduciary duty, uh, managing and disclosing conflicts, the documentation requirement, and others. And for now, I'd just like to point out two such duties that are new to these standards. It's the duties when recommending, engaging, and working with additional persons, as well as the duties when selecting, recommending, and using technology. And the standards of conduct, these are standards 15 and 16. The duty when recommending, engaging, and working with additional persons describes what happens when a CFP professional is working with others to provide services to a client. When engaging or recommending the selection or retention of, of other persons to provide services, a CFP professional is required to have a reasonable basis for the recommendation based on the person's reputation, experience, and qualifications to disclose at the time of the rec recommendation or prior to any arrangement by which someone who is not the client will compensate or provide some other material economic benefit to the CFP professional or their firm or related party for the recommendation or the engagement. The standard also talks about uh, when engaging a person to provide services for a client, the obligation to exercise reasonable care to protect the client's interests. And finally, when working with another uh, financial or professional services provider, a CFP professional is required to communicate with that other provider about the scope of their respective services and the allocation of responsibilities, and to inform the client if the CFP professional has a reasonable belief that the other provider's services were not performed in accordance with the scope of services that are to be provided. Standard 16, the duties when selecting, recommending, and using technology is also a new standard and reflects that tech, the important role that technology plays in the delivery of professional services. This standard is very principles-based, and it begins with the obligation that a CFP professional must exercise reasonable care and judgment when selecting, using, or recommending any software, digital advice tool, or other technology while providing professional services. The CFP professional must also have a reasonable level of understanding of the assumptions and the outcomes that the technology employs and a reasonable basis for believing that the technology produces reliable, objective, and appropriate outcomes. So again, 17 uh, duties owed to clients. We've covered a couple of these. Um, let's turn to the very first one which is the fiduciary duty that's on page one of the proposed standards. Under the proposed fiduciary duty, a CFP professional must at all times act, the, act as a fiduciary when providing financial advice to a client and therefore act in the best interest of the client. So the fiduciary duty ties itself to financial advice. Financial advice is broader than financial planning. As part of the rollout of the proposed revised standards, the CFP Board has issued a number of uh, documents to help facilitate an understanding of what's contained in the proposal. Uh, there's an annotated version of the proposed revised standards. There's a side-by-side -side comparison that sets forth the current proposed standards and compares the proposed standards to the existing uh, standards. In addition, CFP Board has issued a set of FAQs that are intended to address some questions that CFP uh, Board has heard from members of the professional community. One of these is the issue of um, what is the difference between financial planning and financial advice? So, Financial planning is provided through financial advice, 
and therefore all financial planning requires financial advice. But not all financial advice requires financial planning. The proposed standards identify factors that CFP board will weigh in determining whether a CFP professional providing financial advice is required to provide financial planning. The key term, once again, is financial advice, which is defined on page 16 of the standards in the glossary. Financial advice is a communication that, based on its con content, context, and, and presentation, would reasonably be viewed as a suggestion that the client take or refrain from taking a particular course of action with respect to the development or implementation of a financial plan, the value or the advisability of investing in, purchasing, holding, or selling financial assets, investment policies or strategies, portfolio composition, and the management of financial assets or other financial matters, and the selection and retention of other persons to provide financial or professional services to the client. Um, we've been asked, um, oh, and it also includes, by the way, financial advice also includes the exercise of discretionary authority over the financial assets of a client. The CFP board has been asked, how does this apply to general marketing materials or general financial education materials? So the definition itself makes clear that the determination of whether financial advice has been provided is objective rather than subjective. And the more it's individually tailored, the more likely the communication will be viewed as being financial advice. The provision of services or the furnishing of or making available of marketing materials, general financial education materials, or general financial communications that a reasonable person would not view as financial advice does not constitute financial advice. Turning back to the first page of the standards, the fiduciary duty, the fiduciary duty incl includes the duty of loyalty, the duty of care, and the duty to follow client instructions. So the duty of loyalty means that a CFP professional must place the interest of the client above the interest of the CFP professional and the CFP professional's firm and seek to avoid conflicts or fully disclose material conflicts and obtain the client's informed consent and then properly manage that conflict. A CFP professional must also act without regard to the financial or other interests of the CFP professional or their firm or anybody other than the client, which under CFP board standards means that the CFP professional has a duty to act in the best interest of the client and place the client's interest above the CFP professional. Under the duty of care, um, this language uh, we found has been uh, very familiar to CFP professionals. It's that a CFP professional must act with the care, skill, prudence, and diligence that a prudent professional would exercise in light of the client's goals, risks, tolerance, objectives, and financial or personal circumstances. The duty to follow client instructions is simply a reflection that the relationship between the CFP professional and the client is an agency re relationship and that the professional must comply with the objectives, policies, restrictions, and other terms of the engagement and the reasonable and lawful directions of the client. The next standard to discuss is the standard governing the disclosure and management of conflicts. This is on page four of the proposed standards. The disclosure and managing of conflicts section says that when you're providing financial advice, the CFP professional must make full disclosure of all material conflicts of interest. And what that means is that the CFP professional must provide the client with sufficiently specific facts so that the client is able to understand the conflicts and the business practice that gave rise to them and to give their consent to the conflicts or to reject them. So in, de in determining whether to infer that a client has consented, CFP board would evaluate whether a reasonable client receiving the disclosures would have understood the conflict and how it could affect advice. The factors that come into play here are the greater the potential harm the conflict presents and the more significantly a business practice that gives rise to the conflict departs from commonly accepted practices 
the less likely CFP board would infer, would infer informed consent absent clear intent otherwise. The standards also set forth uh, a standard governing the management of conflicts. So the standards makes clear that written consent to the conflict is not required. A CFP professional also must adopt and follow business practices that are reasonably be designed to prevent material conflicts from compromising the ability to act in the client's best interest. Another standard that is set forth in the proposed revised standards of conduct is a documentation standard that's principles-based. The documentation standard is set forth in standard 12 of the document, and it says, in providing financial advice, a CFP professional must act prudently in documenting information that the facts and circumstances require to be documented and act in the best interest of the client, taking into account the significance of the information and the need to preserve the information in writing. Um, I received a question along the way from uh, somebody interested in knowing uh, whether we will receive a copy of the PowerPoint, and I just want you to know that we will be providing a copy of the PowerPoint um, afterwards on the website so that if anybody is interested in seeing it, uh, they may have the benefit of that. I'd like to talk now about the representation of compensation method, which begins on page six of the standards. So the compensation method section begins with the principles-based standards that says, a CFP professional may not make false or misleading representations regarding the CFP professionals or the CFP professionals firm's method of compensation. So there's some key terms and concepts that come uh, forth in this standard. This is standard 14 beginning on page six. Some of these terms are fee only, fee-based, sales-related compensation, related party in connection with, and representations by a CFP professional's firm. So with respect to specific representations, the first of these is the fee-only representation. The language of the proposed standard states that a CFP professional may represent his or her compensation method as fee-only, only if the CFP professional and their firm receives no sales-related compensation, and related parties receive no sales-related compensation in connection with any professional services the CFP professional or their firm provides to clients. So again, this standard incorporates a number of concepts. Let's walk through each of them. So first and foremost is sales-related compensation. What exactly is that? So sales-related compensation is defined in uh, Paragraph B, which begins on page 7, it's more than a de minimis, de minimis economic benefit for purchasing holding for purposes other than providing financial advice or selling a client's financial assets or for the referral of a client to any person or entity. Several examples of this are provided. These include commissions, trailing commissions, 12B1 fees, spread, charges, referral fees, or similar consideration. Um, we've been asked, well, why is this referred to sales related compensation as opposed to commissions? The reason for that is as this list reflects, while very often it's a commission that will be sales related compensation, it's not always a commission that does so. There are times when a fee meets the standard and so therefore the term sales-related compensation was provided. We provided um, some instances where sales-related compensation does not occur. Um, that has to do with soft dollars, um, where there's reasonable and customary fees for custodial or similar administrative services. 
if that fee or the amount of it is not determined based upon the amount or value of the client transaction, as well as the receipt by a related party solicitor of a fee for soliciting clients for the CFP professional or their firm. Another important uh, concept here is related party. So a related party is defined in Section C. It's a person or business entity whose receipt of sales related compensation a CFP professional reasonably would view as benefiting the CFP professional or the CFP professional's firm, including, for example, as a result of their ownership stake in a business entity. So there is a rebuttable presumption that several categories um, would be in considered related parties. First and foremost is family members. And second is business entities that the CFP professional or the CFP professional's firm controls or that is controlled by or under, is under common control with the CFP professional's firm. An important, uh, an important uh, element of this standard is in addition to being a related party, the sales-related compensation must be in connection with any professional services that the CFP professional or their firm provides to clients. What we mean by in connection with professional services is provided in Section D, where it says that sales-related compensation is in connection with those services if it results from client transactions referred to or facilitated by the CFP professional or their firm. The proposed standard provides a safe harbor for related parties when a CFP professional or their firm has adopted and implemented policies and procedures reasonably designed uh, to prevent uh, their firm or themselves from making, uh, from recommending that any client purchase from it, financial assets from or through or refer any clients to the related party. The proposed standards also set forth a standard for misrepresentations by a CFP professional's firm. So here, a CFP professional who controls the firm may not allow the firm to make false or misleading representations of compensation method. Where the CFP professional does not control the firm, they must correct the firm's misrepresentations by accurately presenting uh, to, the, to the clients the CFP professional's compensation method. Another uh, specific term that's discussed in the standard has to do with fee-based. So CFP board um, has a history of using the term fee and commission to describe the compensation method of those who receive both fees and sales-related compensation. Uh, the standard reflects that CFP professionals who do uh, represent that their compensation method is fee-based must do two things. First is not use the term in a manner that suggests the CFP professional or their firm is fee only. And second is clearly state that either the CFP professional earns fees and commissions or that the CFP professional is not fee only. Let's turn to the next standard that we'll be discussing today this is the standard that governs information being provided to a prospective client. This is set forth on page four, and it's standard number 10, providing information to a prospective client. So this standard, uh, which is new, begins that a CFP professional must provide to a prospective client, and a prospective client as these standards envision that term, is a person to whom the CFP professional reasonably anticipates providing financial advice, provide a, a plain English summary of material information about the CFP professional and their firm. So there are several ways that this may be done. Um, first is uh, that a CFP professional would satisfy these requirements by delivering a properly completed form ADV parts 2A and 2B. So in other words, if the CFP professional has the uh, form 2A, 2B, they provide that to the prospective client, 
uh, then the standard is satisfied. There are other ways a CFP professional may satisfy this standard. Um, first is a document containing the information set forth on page five within section, uh, you know, subsection B of the standard, uh, providing a brief description of the services and categories of financial products that the CFP professional offers to clients, describing how the client pays and how the CFP professional and the firm are compensated, providing a brief summary of some specific categories of conflicts, such as the offering of proprietary products, the receipt of third-party payments for recommending products, material limitations on the universe of products, the receipt of bonuses, or other non-cash compensation for selling products, and the uh, additional compensation when the, client in, when the client increases the amount of assets under management. In addition, what's to be provided under the proposed standard is a link or URL for the relevant web pages of a public website of a government authority or SRO or professional organizations that set forth disciplinary history. Um, somebody within the questions has asked whether CFP board will be providing a template that may be used in connection with this document or you know, for this document. And uh, CFP board will be doing so uh, we will be uh, preparing and providing um, a sample document that may be used uh, to satisfy this standard that contains these four categories of information. This is information that may be provided on one or perhaps two pages, so the intent is that the template or the, or the proposal would be a short document, and uh, this would be a sample or proposal that uh, CFP professionals would be able to modify uh, to fit their uh, proposed, you know, their circumstances. The proposed standards uh, talk about when uh, this document is to be provided. Uh, a CFP professional would provide it at the time of the initial consultation or as soon as practical thereafter. It may be, uh, it should be provided in writing. It says it must be provided in writing unless there is a reasonable basis for providing the information orally, taking into account several, several factors. And um, a CFP professional may deliver that uh, document if it's provided in written form electronically. Another document that, that would call for providing information um, is one that would be provided to a client now this standard, which is the 11th standard of conduct, the 11th duty uh, to clients set forth in the standards of conduct, beginning on page five of the proposed standard, is effectively a continuation of CFP board's existing standards uh, with some, uh, with some uh, minor modifications uh, to, uh, to some of the provisions. But overall, this standard uh, applies when a CFP professional is uh, required to provide financial planning, so when you're required to comply with the practice standard, a CFP professional would be required to provide the information set forth um, in this standard to the client either prior to the time of the engagement, um, you know, prior to the time of the engagement or at the time of the engagement, and it would be in one or more written documents if not previously provided in writing. So in other words, the 11th standard, which talks about providing information to a client, set forth the requirements for when this information should be provided. It would be provided in writing, but it does not need to be all in one document. It may be provided in multiple documents. So first and foremost is the terms of the engagement. Secondly is the description of how the client pays and how the CFP professional and their firm are compensated for providing services or products. A description of the additional types of costs, again, this is by type that the client may incur, and this includes product management fees, for example, surrender charges, sales loads, those are some examples. The identification of related parties that will receive compensation for providing those services or offering products. A full disclosure of material conflicts of interest a link or URL to web pages of government authorities, SROs, or professional organizations that set forth disciplinary history or uh, bankruptcies. The CAP professional uh, 
then must provide to the client in writing uh, material changes or updates to the information. That may be done annually. If there's been public discipline or bankruptcy, that must be disclosed to the client within 90 days. One of the questions that has been raised is, does the term of the engagement include the duration of the engagement? So the term of the engagement would include the periods for which the services would be provided. Um, so it does, uh, in fact, cover uh, the duration of the engagement between the CFP professional and or their firm and the client. I'd like to turn now to the definition of financial planning. At CFP Board, this is a very, very important uh, definition. Our existing definition of financial planning is a definition that CFP Board's Board of Directors and its Commission on Standards believe is a very robust and good definition. One issue that has arisen um, is the simple length of the definition of financial planning. Um, some of the perspective that we heard in the public forums and otherwise um, is that the financial planning definition um, is uh, too long, that we would benefit from having a shorter definition of financial planning in the standards. This is an attempt at doing so. Uh, the CFP Board did send out a survey at the CFP professionals seeking feedback on a number of points, including this financial planning definition. When the survey is complete, we're intending to keep the survey open till the close of the comment period. Uh, we will then release the results of the survey. Uh, but this financial planning definition is one we've asked very specifically, do you agree with this definition? Are there changes you would like to see made to this? So let me read the definition to you and then walk through briefly what it says. The definition is, financial planning is a collaborative process that helps maximize a client's potential for meeting life goals through financial advice that integrates relevant elements of the client's personal and financial circumstances. So we begin, it's 30 words, and we begin with the concept this is a collaborative process. So first and foremost, um, this definition says that financial planning is a process, that it's collaborative, that the CFP professional is working with others, most significantly with the client, to deliver financial planning. It then says that helps maximize the client's potential. Um, here, uh, that is the focus of advice. Uh, the, the intent of this definition, at least this component of the definition, is to reflect what a client receives by getting advice. It's uh, the interest in having the client's potential uh, be advanced through that advice. Uh, the language here says helps maximize the client's potential We've received some feedback about the word maximize and some other discussion points um, on the road. I can see a comment uh, that somebody has offered, perhaps we could use the word focus instead of maximize or instead of helps maximize to better achieve. There are different terms that might be used here. If you have a preference, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to receive your uh, comments on that front. But the goal overall is to give effect uh, to the delivery of advice. Uh, the next element of this discusses meeting life goals. So uh, one might say that the purpose is to help somebody meet their financial goals. The word life goals was provided here uh, based on the view that financial goals are a means to the end, but not the end itself, that what a CFP professional is doing is helping the client uh, achieve financial goals so that they may uh, meet life goals. And for that reason, those words were selected. We mentioned this earlier in discussing the difference between financial planning and financial advice, that financial planning is provided through financial advice. So the CFP professional is providing that financial advice um, as part of uh, the providing the financial planning. And then a key element here is the language that begins that integrates relevant elements. So the integration is a very important point. Integration uh, means that the CFP professional is looking at these various elements of the client's personal and financial circumstances and uh, looking at them holistically, if you might, 
integrating these elements of their life uh, to provide this financial planning. Relevant elements are not set forth in the definition. They're provided otherwise so that the definition itself can be shorter and more crisp. And once again, it's looking at the client's personal and financial circumstances. This is what becomes relevant is or are those personal and financial circumstances. Um, I appreciate some feedback I'm receiving uh, through the comments I'm hearing to better achieve instead of maximize. A couple people are pointing out. Uh, somebody else has said uh, you might want to consider optimize. Uh, these are useful words uh, to consider. I know that the commission and the board will be looking at this very seriously, uh, weighing this feedback um, as it moves forward with uh, defining or redefining financial planning, which is so critically important here at CFP Board. I do want to point out, once again, this is 30 words. Somebody reading this definition should have a couple of questions. They should wonder, well, what is the process itself? Well, the process at CFP Board is the, uh, the financial planning practice standards. And they may also wonder, you know, what are the relevant elements? So the relevant elements are set forth also on uh, page 9 of the standards. It's section B2 that talks about the relevant elements. Let me talk about some of them here. So under the existing standards, we have the financial planning subject areas. And the financial planning uh, uh, subject areas, in some ways, focus from the CFP professional's perspective, you know, what are the areas that you're assisting, you know, which you're assisting the client. The relevant elements take that and try and place it in a client uh, perspective. They're looking at what are the client's needs or desires? So the list that have been set forth here as examples, again, now this is not a definition of relevant elements. It's examples of them. Uh, take, and, and noting, uh, by the way, that these relevant elements vary from client to client, and they may include the client's needs or desire to develop goals, manage a budget, identify and manage risk, address health considerations, provide for educational needs, achieve financial security, preserve or increase wealth, manage taxes, prepare for retirement, pursue philanthropic interests, and address estate and legacy matters. Um, this is a fairly robust list that the commission and the board developed for what will be included in the relevant elements, uh, and we're hoping that we'll receive feedback from you as to whether these are uh, the relevant elements that should uh, be provided under CFE board standards. So an important topic in the, in the standards, both currently and the proposed revised standards, are, you know, when do the practice standards apply? So under the proposed revised Code of Ethics and Standard of Conduct, the fiduciary duty applies to all financial advice, which is, from CFP Board's perspective, the technically precise way of saying it applies at all times. Um, the question then becomes, so when you're providing that financial advice, when do you need to follow the practice standards? So here uh, it's set forth in section B3 of the standards of conduct on page 9 of the document. And uh, there's two, two ways in which the practice standards would apply. So first is if the CAP professional agrees to provide or provides financial planning or advice that requires uh, the CFP professional to integrate relevant elements of the client's personal or financial circumstances to act in the client's best interest. In other words, even if it's not referred to as financial planning, if financial planning is required, uh, then the CFP professional needs to follow the practice standards. Uh, the other way that the practice standards would apply is when the client has a reasonable basis to believe that the CFP prof professional will provide or has provided financial planning uh, so here, um, this is not the client's understanding. This has to be a reasonable basis. The client has to have a reasonable basis that financial planning would be required. So this leads to the question of, you know, when does financial advice require financial planning? So CFP Board knows that financial planning benefits the consumer. It's good for the public. And so CFP Board has set forth um, in here a presumption that financial planning is required. 
This also reflects uh, the concept that a CFP professional is the one um, who is best able to know whether financial planning is necessary. So this doesn't mean that a CFP professional must always provide financial planning. Far from it, uh, CFP board understands that CFP professionals very often are providing financial advice that does not require financial planning. Uh, but when an issue arises, and for example, if a CFP professional uh, were to have an issue uh, that were to arise, and the CFP board's Disciplinary and Ethics Commission would be evaluating it, it would be the CFP professional who would have uh, the best information to be able to explain why financial planning was not provided. The factors that CFP board would weigh in determining whether financial planning would be required has been uh, modified slightly, but we believe captures uh, effectively uh, very similar concepts to what exists in the current standards. Um, and um, first of all, it's the number of relevant elements of the circumstances that the advice affects, the portion and amount of the assets that the advice may affect, the length of time uh, the circumstances may be affected by the advice, the effect on uh, the client's exposure to risk if they implement the advice, and the barriers to modifying the actions taken to implement the advice. Um, one comment we've received um, has to do with uh, the term, the rebuttable presumption. And I think uh, we've heard uh, comments on that issue about whether rebuttable presumption is the appropriate way to describe it, or perhaps there might be some other language that might be used. I can assure you that that's something that the uh, Commission on Standards and the Board itself will be reviewing and considering as it moves its way uh, forward and considering the proposed revised standards. The factors that CFP Board will weigh, which are uh, presented in the PowerPoint, these are very important factors, and uh, we uh, really appreciate feedback we're receiving and will receive from members of the professional community about are these the factors that uh, should be weighed to determine whether financial planning is required? Are these the factors you would weigh? Are there other uh, factors you might consider? Um, you know, the first one, for example, is the number of relevant elements. We talked about how important that is. Um, if more relevant elements of the client's financial and personal circumstances are involved, Again, that's a factor that would be weighed in considering whether financial planning would be required. Uh, this was also set forth in the uh, question questions that we sent out for uh, to CFP professionals as part of the survey. Uh, hearing your viewpoint on this is critically important to CFP board as it moves forward uh, with finalizing the standards. I do want to point out a couple things. We are uh, nearing, uh, you know, we're really uh, close to. Uh, uh, you know, finishing up my uh, overview for the webinar for the standards, I did want to point out um, that we began the webinar a little bit late uh, because of the audio issues. I'm going to stay on the line until uh, we work our way through the webinar. The webinar will be recorded so that if you're interested in listening to the end of it, perhaps, if you have to drop off at 3 o'clock, we certainly understand 3 o'clock Eastern, uh, we certainly understand that. Um, so you will be able to uh, listen to the rest of the webinar if you are uh, finding that you need to drop off the call. But let me work through a couple of more points here. Again, this is still in Section B of the, um, of the proposed uh, standards of conduct. It's the issue, what if a CFP professional concludes that financial planning is required, but the client does not agree to engage the professional to provide financial planning? The client, for example, doesn't want to provide the information or other additional information, or perhaps there's an additional cost associated with it that the client doesn't want to occur. And so long as the CAP professional informs the client that that decision could constrain the advice, the CAP professional has several choices. First is to limit the scope of the engagement. So, if, for example, the CAP professional is being asked to provide education planning and investment planning and after applying the factors given those circumstances, if in that instance financial planning is required, the CFP professional could say, well, I may provide the education planning, but not the investment planning if you will not let me provide financial planning. That's one way to do it. Um, another way that some, some CFP professionals say, if I'm not providing financial planning, I'm not going to be able to work with you. Um, that's you know, certainly an option to you. Uh, but in Section uh, C here, uh, what it says is that a CFP professional has made clear to the client uh, what the constraints are. The CFP professional could provide those services 
subject to the constraint. The idea here is that if, this, if the client is not interested in receiving financial planning from the CFP professional, they're also not likely uh, to be interested in wanting financial planning from somebody else. And so rather than saying that a CFP professional can't service that client, um, this is a recognition that they would continue to be able to provide those services um, and could provide that service to the client uh, subject to the, uh, uh, the language set forth herein. So the practice standards themselves begin on page 10 of the proposed standards, um, the practice standards for the financial planning process. And as I mentioned earlier, the practice standards are um, highly important to CFP board. They are really an important part of the delivery of financial planning. Um, CFP professionals use the practice standards. People who are learning how to provide financial planning rely on the practice standards. Um, so it's important that they be comprehensive and robust. The Commission on Standards and the Board of Directors took a detailed look um, at these uh, practice standards with an eye to updating them to reflect the modern delivery of financial planning. Um, just given time constraints, we're not going to be able to go through um, each element of the practice standards today. Uh, but um, we do uh, appreciate receiving your feedback as to whether um, these standards do reflect the uh, financial planning process. One thing we have heard from some CAP professionals is in looking at some of the practice standards, they say there are uh, several um, elements to the practice standards. I often, uh, you know, handle these various issues in one meeting. You know, maybe there's three or four things happening. They say oftentimes I'm able to do that in one meeting. And that makes sense. There are, certainly, if you walk through, um, you know, the various components of the practice standards, um, experienced CAP professionals often uh, do accomplish uh, a lot in a conversation with the client. Um, but this is intended to draw out that process to capture step by step how it should occur. Some of the significant changes are the scope of the engagement has been removed from the practice standards. Um, the concept here is that the practice standards themselves talk about the delivery of services, whereas the scope of the engagement talks about establishing, you know, or uh, modifying the relationship between the client and the professional. And then moving forward, um, it had always been, uh, you know, the, the second standard gathering client data and determining the client's goals. Um, here what the standards do is the standards call for obtaining qualitative and quantitative information. And if you will look at the qualitative information, it does include obtaining what the client believes or his or her goals at the beginning of the relationship. But what happens then is after the client has provided this qualitative and quantitative information, the CFP professional then moves forward with understanding the client's personal financial circumstances before identifying selecting the goals um, that will be uh, used in the financial planning process. Um, some steps have been uh, reorganized. So uh, the third step in what is now a seven-step proposed process talks about analyzing the current course of action and the potential recommendations. And then uh, moving on from there, the developing and presenting the financial planning recommendation has been broken out uh, based on the perception that there are really different steps of the process, whereas the developing the recommendation may be um, occurring by the CFP professional back in the office or elsewhere. Um, it's the presenting the recommendation that is uh, with the client that that occurs. Of course, developing the, recommending, uh, developing the financial planning recommendation may also occur with the client uh, where um, the CFP professional and the client may be working together to do that. Uh, but ultimately, the presenting and the developing are broken out here as separate standards. So implementing and monitoring, the implementing um, has been broken out a little bit more to talk about addressing the responsibilities, identifying and analyzing what might be the actions, products, or services uh, before making the recommendations and then before making the selection. Again, treating those uh, to be sequential. Monitoring the existing standards, uh, basically just uh, refer the CAP professional to the duty to define the monitoring responsibilities. Um, here, the monitoring responsibilities are set forth in much greater detail. Um, and now, uh, the standards as proposed 
uh, now address addressing the responsibilities, monitoring the progress, obtaining updated information, current qualitative and quantitative information, and then updating the goals and recommendations or the implementation decisions. So these are, again, different steps that occur as you're moving uh, forward through this monitoring requirement. I want to touch on briefly before we conclude the call um, the duties owed to employers, principals, and subordinates. Um, in many respects, this is very similar to the existing standards. Um, the obligation to use reasonable care when supervising uh, persons acting under their direction. Uh, there's a principles-based standard that applies uh, on page 13. This is section D of the standards of conduct. Complying with the lawful objectives of the firm. So really, this is a statement that CFP board doesn't discipline uh, CFP professionals um, uh, you know, for violating their firm's policies and procedures um, where they conflict with these standards. So that's an important uh, component of that standard. And then providing notice of discipline, again, um, that's um, an important obligation for a CFP professional under our standards. The uh, duties owed to CFP board um, section, which is section E of the uh, proposed Code of Ethics and Standards of Conduct, uh, it talks about several points. Under our existing standards, there's a section called 6.5, uh, which uh, captures these concepts. The concept of the CFP professional may not engage in conduct that reflects adversely on his or her integrity or fitness as a CFP professional upon the CFP marks or upon the profession. Um, that concept continues here. What's been added is really greater detail uh, that CFP board has based upon years of experience, uh, experience applying the current standards. So we set forth what this conduct um, includes. These are such things as a, fel a felony or a misdemeanor um, where it's been a criminal offense for conduct involving fraud, theft, misrepresentation, other dishonest conduct, crimes of moral turpitude, violence, or when there's been a second or more alcohol or drug-related offense. Uh, those are the types of things that get brought in. Again, there's a list here of them, and it includes personal or business bankruptcies. And this is an important point. Under the uh, current standards, uh, a bankruptcy is something that gets disclosed automatically by CFP board. Um, the proposed standards uh, return CFP board to the position it had prior to 2012, where bankruptcy is an issue that would uh, go to our Disciplinary and Ethics Commission such that a CFP professional would have the opportunity to rebut the presumption that the bankruptcy demonstrates an inability to manage the CFP professionals or their business, uh, businesses financial affairs responsibly. Um, that's an, it's a very important point um, about uh, a change that exists in the proposed revised standards. Um, the reporting uh, requirement is what we have now when CFP board finds out about these issues. Um, so here, CFP professional is required to provide notice to CFP board within 30 days um, after the conduct occurs, and then uh, and then after that, provide a statement explaining uh, what it is that happened uh, that describes the facts and the outcomes or the status, and then cooper you know cooperation involves you know not making false or misleading statements to CFP board or obstructing CFP board in the performance of its duties cooperating fully with CFP board, um, you know, using best efforts to cooperate. Um, the language is set forth in the proposed standards, and we'd love to receive your feedback on that. And then finally, complying with the terms and conditions of uh, certification is, is part of the standards as well. That's on page 16. It's the very um, last standard in section E. So where do we go from here? Um, so after CFP board issues the final revised standard, the CFP board has uh, set a goal of providing additional compliance resources to CFP professionals. This could be FAQs, webinars, other compliance materials. Um, there will be a continuing education course to address the new code and standards to help uh, spread awareness of what is set forth in the proposed code and standards. And um, very important, the public comment period, the public comment period is open now. It remains open until August 21st, 2017. If you're interested in providing comments, 
and we encourage you to do so. Uh, please review the proposal, submit your comments at www.cfp.net forward slash proposed slash standard. Again, in response to some additional questions, we will be making this PowerPoint available on our website. Uh, the website, uh, the, the, um, the webinar is being recorded. We will be providing a recording of the webinar on our website for anybody who was not able to listen in who would like to be able to do so. And um, I want to thank you for uh, you uh, taking the time to listen to the webinar, for participating. I was pleased to see uh, the comments that appeared and I tried to incorporate some of those questions as we worked our way uh, through the webinar. We look forward to receiving your comments on August 21st. There has been no deadline or date set uh, by which CFP Board will come back out uh, with their proposed revised standards. It will depend upon the comments uh, that we receive and CFP Board's Commission on Standards and Board of Directors will be working diligently to evaluate those comments and moving forward um, as it's had the opportunity uh, to do so. So on behalf of CFP Board, once again, Thank you very much uh, for participating in this webinar, and um, uh, have a great day.